Hello everyone, I'd like to introduce you to the Makes You Wonder My Story. Um, you've got the general introduction in the video on the front page of the makesyouwonder.yola site. Um, I'd like to introduce you to some of the more detailed um, aspects of the site. Now, uh, good. finding my way around this uh, machine is interesting. On the uh, download site for Makes You Wonder Workshops, there are five sections, six, seven. My story, your story, our story, the story, Purple Cow Workshops, Wonder Workshops, and the Leaders Resources. Um, these are all phenomenal. Now, I'm going to just take you through one of them. The um, download site for My Story brings up a blue cover with a picture of um, a chap at Lake Eyre. As the water recedes, you can see no gap between earth and heaven on that horizon. The hard part about my story is where people learn to be their Christian self. One of the things uh, that happens the most is that people shut themselves off. They shut themselves down. They pretend to be secular. And that's pushed on us by our culture, when in fact what's in our heart to share is something of the grace of God. So... Being as simply our Christian self is actually countercultural, and sharing our story is not just a little sweet thing, but in fact it's a, a powerful thing which helps us to get beyond barriers. Um, there's a, one book I'd like to share with you by called Speak by Nish Wiseth, published by Zondervan. It's um, the first chapter is absolutely fabulous about the significance of story. Okay, what we're on do, doing now is we've gone to the page which has all of the list of exercises. Um, motivations with three M's. Um, 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 motivations. <laughs> and then how God is in me. Begin, belong, decide. Uh, three pastoral exercises. Um, three prayer exercises are in section six. Three exercises in imagination, parables, pauses and pictures. The gifts we bring, keeping your faith alive and invest. Um, in the, in the second half, from uh, six on, you find lots of short exercises gathered around a the theme. You can do them all in one session, or you can do little bits and pieces. Um, this takes leadership. You've got to get started. Topic one is about motivations. And we begin uh, with the goal being to find out what motivates us to want to share our faith and just become um, a, more aware of that and give that to more, more um, cherishing and significance rather than the cultural cringe or that thing of being timid. Um, um, so the key question there is, have you ever felt you made a mistake in sharing your faith or in withholding your faith? And how did that feel and did you learn anything from it? And what you find probably in the discussion is that some people uh, say, oh, I'll never do that again. In other words, they've become more afraid. Rather than being able to face a mistake and learn from it, we're actually finding that people are not learning from it. So it's important for us to discover and uncover what some of the motivations are that are driving us so that we can. And all of, all of uh, makes you one that will help people to learn from their mistakes. It unpacks the whole process so they're not shamed any longer. So we're using the, the big M of McDonald's, you know, the three feet, the great big M with three legs. It reminds us of three M's make more mistakes. If people are not making more mistakes, then they're not even trying. And uh, the, the outcome is sort of pretty arrogant. The fact is that if you make a mistake, you can say, oops, sorry. Um, another small exercise there is that for people to write a 25 word prayer to bring it to the group and to uh, say it. And, um, you know, 25's you know, a, a loose number, it can be 20 or 30, but obviously it means you've got to condense your focus, your, your motivation. So that's why it's a good exercise. And it's bringing it before God, not just having a whinge to each other. And then some, some scripture um, as well. Uh, just reconnecting us with our story and some other wise quotes. Um, just get people to, to discuss those quotes. And uh, then you as a facilitator uh, bring their conversation into summary. You point out the significance of what we've been talking about. In, and I've given you an idea of the way to, to, to speak a conclusion 
on the bottom of page five. The second topic uh, on page six, how God is in me. Most of you who've done a taster or something have done the exercise, why are you still a Christian? And you've seen how very powerful it is. Um, and that's the goal of this exercise, to discover my personal story and how, how I uncover its power. It used to be that people would prepare a testimony of what they were like before they became a Christian and what they were like after they became a Christian. But that pales in, in, in fact because that really means that only those who know a decisive conversion moment in their life can speak when, in fact, most people become Christians slowly and sometimes can't tell it before and after. Those who grew up in a Christian family can't tell it before and after. And according to Ron Sider's research in the US, some of those who, who may have a conversion moment are often totally more disreputable afterwards than before. So the better question is, why are you still a Christian? Why have you not given up like so many? Why, why are you still here? Why are you giving time and energy to this now? And, uh, and you, you remember the steps where people talk to each other, um, and talk to and then share one another's stories, and then you read them as a litany from the board, having changed the title into a litany. And it's good to just then cover from people. What's what your emotions as you read that story? Because that's something that will help you to prove to them that, in fact, the story is very powerful. Okay. It's a very powerful exercise. It's good to have a bit of, a bit of time off afterwards. Um, um, it's also good to point out that almost every answer that's on the board is actually not a religious answer. It's more a human answer. So that they are ready to engage with society outside the walls of the church. They are already ready. And they're more ready than they realise. There are things they can do more than they realise. There are more conversations you can have, and there are other key questions to try on the bottom of page nine. Um, I've found that uh, over the years that I've been uh, leading this workshop, my answers change a bit. That's because my, my faith in discipleship continues to grow and deepen and get fractured. <laughs> and uh, then you have some difficult years and some um, times of great blessing. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said I'm still a Christian because I'm held, because we had a couple of really tough years, actually. And uh, God just held, held on to us. Um, but things are different now. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm soaring with uh, delight in the purposes of God being felt in my life. Um, the years that the locusts have eaten have been restored. And um, so my answer to that question would be different uh, now. God is, on, is the wind under my wings. That's why I'm still a Christian. Then you move to topic three, and this is the beginning of three exercises, which are pastoral exercises. And the overall goal of which is to let people know what they can already do. That faith sharing is actually a normal part of life, and, uh, and kind of the subtext is how to be normal though Christian. So we begin with uh, the exercise on beginning, um, and describe clearly and simply the practicality of starting out as a follower of Christ. You don't have to do this before the other two, but it's good to do all three of them um, in, in close uh, succession. So the, the begin exercise is, um, is how to start off being a Christian. The research shows that having not so much one huge uh, faith commitment moment, but, but to mark your journey with moments of commitment, um, it's kind of like putting a signpost saying, well, I'm not going back. It's marking your life with small commitments uh, uh, that shape and give you ongoing direction. And so it, it's good to, to do this, even if you're... So if you're in conversation with somebody and it's clear that they're kind of moving on board with the things that Jesus says and does and might want to follow him, then it's good to say, look, uh, do you want to start off being a Christian and knowing you are? Do you want to seal this? Do you want to nail this? Do you, want to, do you want to mark this? And now it's not now the sinner's prayer. That's what used to be in the old paradigm. Uh, the prayer of commitment um, was just a ticket to heaven. And it was, I think that was used and abused, frankly. Um, and quite often I, I used to find that if you led, led somebody in the sinner's prayer, that's not actually where they were. It's not really where they were feeling like they wanted to start off. Um, so using that formula was wrong. But if you've been listening to this person, you've been having conversations with them, and you hear how they describe some, some, some warm heart towards Jesus, 
then use their language and help them to find a prayer whereby they say a prayer of direction and of uh, commitment to, uh, of, in some way to Jesus. So the exercise follows up this question, well, what helped you to start off being a Christian? Another, another question to try is tell of a time when you felt like you were recommencing or you just had to relearn, you'd re, you, you recommitted your life to Christ. What was that about? Um, what was the, so what we find is, it, it's a, depending on how you count them, a bit of a typo. We call it the four loves in the text, but it's actually um, five loves. The key question then is, what does God want from people? And, of course, what God wants is five loves, how to love, be in love with God, how to be in love with one another, how to be in love with your neighbours, how to be in love with your enemies, and how to love your world. Those are all very basic gospel commands. and that's So you tend to find people who want to super complicate things. And they, they say a lot about loving God, but they don't say much about um, the other part of the L, you know, the you know, vertical love and then the horizontal love. They make an L. That shows up as an L on your screen. <laughs> um, um, and, and so there's love of God and all the other loves of one another, of love of neighbours, love of enemies, love of the world, the way God so loved the world. So that's, uh, that's discipleship, uh, those loves. Now, um, all kinds of people have all kinds of trauma and difficulty, and uh, it doesn't really matter which one they start with, frankly, just as long as it's an L. So they might be starting with love of enemies. You know, I know someone who's become a Christian because um, the way someone had abused them, had eaten them up, and they needed to love their enemies. That was the way they began their discipleship. And, uh, and so they said a prayer, which is a way of loving God, right? Um, and I, I tell you, it was holy ground as I sat next to this person and, uh, and she forgave the one who had abused her. I felt incredibly privileged uh, to see um, the launch of, of this um, new, new life. Okay. So the key question is what does God want from people? And as they feed back what they think about it, then summarise it in terms of the five loves, have that ready on your whiteboard and uh, categorise their answers into one of those five. They all fit there. This is pretty good biblical theology and, uh, and so on. And there's some suggestions about the talk. Then, of course, as is always the case, when you come to your conclusion, um, don't keep going on and on. Say, look, let's bring this conclusion. It seems to me what we've been talking about is, and what you've discovered is it's very easy to kind of complicate, complicate, complicate um, what it means to be a Christian, but um, and, or even just ask too much. You know, you've got too many details. You've got all the, all the commands of the Pharisees. But this exercise helps you to frame this very simply as a love story and uh, helps people begin. They know that, that you, they know they can begin and they know when they've begun. So that's why it's such a valuable pastoral tool. And anybody can help somebody else see where love is. Okay, so that's the beginning exercise. Belong exercise is because coming to belief and coming to belong are parallel paths these days. It's not like it used to be. People come to believe and then they start going to church. That doesn't seem to be the trend these days. So belong talks about um, different aspects of belonging to the body of Christ. Um, so the exercise um, raises your awareness as to what you can do to help somebody. Okay, now, it doesn't ask the question, you know, how do you help somebody come to church? Because they usually kind of, take that question too intensely, you know, like it's a bit anxious. What you do is you ask them another question and, and you're taking a kind of a, a circular path or a parabola or a parable thinking into indirectly and using their own experience in another field as an analogy for that. So you just ask, tell us of a time when you went to a club or a place or a ch another church maybe or to a party at someone's house, you didn't know people, and what was that like? Um, how long did it take you to make you feel like you wanted to run out the door? What helped you to feel comfortable? What helped you to feel uncomfortable? And then just start to use that experience as the basis, writing it all up, all the different points, write that up and then sit back and say, so what does this tell us about people coming into a church community for the first time? What are some good ways to help them begin and what are some things we shouldn't really be doing, you know, like making them stand up and tell us their name? And that could be, you know, wonderful or terrible. The other thing that we've noticed uh, in, in uh, um, church health is um, that if a church has a super tight system for welcoming newcomers, 
it's often people often don't feel welcomed. They don't feel they belong. Why? Because it's too organised. It's somebody else's job to do it. When, when welcoming becomes an everybody function, I went to a new church last Sunday and I told, they did everything right about you know welcoming a newcomer. They did everything right. And, uh, but we still didn't feel like we belonged. Um, and this doesn't, if people leave, it's not your fault. And there is such a thing as church shopping too. Um, you can do everything right about helping somebody belong, but they still might not do it. So don't beat up on, don't beat yourself up. But uh, on the conclusion at the bottom of uh, page 13, uh, you'll see um, five things where I'd summarise what it takes. You need a one-on-one -on -one contact. You need a mentor, I'm calling it. You need a, the, the people need a job they can do. They need a small group they can belong to. Um, sometimes it's belonging to a church community as a whole, but sometimes it's not the best place. I think sometimes church, church services particularly can be very strong curry and not everybody can eat it. And having, finding three to five Christian friends whom they call peers. Not necessarily the same uh, age group, perhaps the same life stage or, I don't know. I don't know. They've got to find them. And if they can't find them in your church, then find them, find them, you know, in a lunchtime Bible study or something. Okay? And there's a Bible study option about uh, how you do that. The, the third pastoral topic is the decision exercise. This is really fun. And again, we're finding a, a parabolic path around to, from their experience, to look then look back on how they can be a friend to someone in the process of deciding for Christ. And it's again, it's a whole lot of normal things they discover that are quite apt and suitable and that they can already do. Um, what they're doing is, in this exercise, they come to think of a, a reasonably large decision that they've made in life um, that would affect their life, you know, where to live, where to get a job, you know, what sort of career to take up. Um, I don't want, you know, who to marry or, you know, things that are hopelessly romantic or even becoming a Christian or any of those decisions. I want normal life decisions. Um, what car to buy or whether to buy one. What, whether to change the colour of your hair or, you know, big decisions. And then you talk about it in three ways. What were the factors involved in raising the matter? And then what were the factors involved in making the decision and what were the factors in living with that decision and not going back again? And you rule up your board in three columns and, and, and what went into raising it, what went into deciding it, what went into sticking with it. Okay, I, I just clicked on, I hope you can see it on your screen, uh, one of the boards from this exercise. Um, what raised the matter, what was the process they used, what made them stick to it. You can use whatever keywords you like, but three columns before, during and after are pretty good. And, and each of these, they talk about different kinds of decisions and lots of stuff, as you can see, lots of process about what went into it. And um, so there's probably about 20 different points on this board. What it means is that by the end of this exercise, the big decision exercise, there's at least 20 things that you can do that are entirely normal to help a person find and to decide to follow Christ, including, um, if you look at the board, somebody, um, an opportunity came up, which was one of the things that raised the, this particular matter for this person. Just an opportunity came up, and so they thought about it. And the same with Christ. Um, you can be the one who raises an opportunity, simple as that. It doesn't have to come out of the processes of their life. It just has to be presented in such a way that it's seen as an opportunity. So you can see you're deciding, you're talking about normal life decisions and then discovering how normal it is to, be, to, to participate in at least 20 or 30 different ways in the process by which people can make a decision for Christ. Good pastoral caring, long-term uh, stuff. Okay? That's a really good exercise. So that's the big decision exercise. Those are the three pastoral exercises. I recommend you do, uh, do them together. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. Okay. Let's move on to page 16, the prayer partners and the life groups. Um, I, I used to put this exercise in. It's the goal is, uh, is, is to give practical expression 
to, uh, to our own longings to grow in faith, but also to pray for others. It works like this. People often say, um, so-and-so is way, a long way away from Christ. Or they've rejected Christ. They've put a wall up, a barrier. Well, friends, when we pray, we take the bricks that are their long way away, of the road that are a long way away or the bricks from the wall that they've erected and we make a pathway back again. And if they're a long way away, then you better get a lot of praying done because you are paving the road. If the wall is high, you better get praying because you've got a lot of work to do to take each brick down. We give an exercise in, if you're doing makes you wonder as a particular project or a small group or something, then, then take on one of these three prayer exercises in this topic um, for six weeks. And then at the end, say, what has God done with us? And, and, and what have we learned and what do we do next? It's a, just a good debrief after six weeks um, and, and make it very focused on the prayer exercise in particular. If you're doing this as a congregation, um, the same thing. So, okay, for six weeks, 40 days, it can be a Lenten exercise or an Advent exercise or any other time of the year. We're going to be praying a particular prayer and see what God does. This is not just a cute kind of, you know, pietistic thing. And the, the theology of mission says that the mission is God's. It's not that the church has a mission. It's that God has a mission and, and for that he brings to, into life a church. So when we do the mission, it's God's initiative beginning to end. So by having strong prayer disciplines about the mission, you continue to subscribe to the idea that this is God's initiative. It is he who uses us and he who blesses us in the doing. You know, we're on a journey as much as anybody else. So the things we learn and things we gain and the things that we're always shown up by or the mistakes we make in the course of evangelism and mission are good for us. They're part of what God is doing with us. Okay, here's the first of the three exercises in prayer, and you can choose one, two, or three of them. The first is this. It only takes five seconds to change the world. Here it is. A daily prayer. Lord, please lead me to someone today with whom I can share your influence in my life. Amen. Five seconds. If that becomes your daily prayer discipline, you'll be amazed at how from such an authentic, surrendering prayer, interesting things happen. Interesting things happen. And you can change the words if you want. Maybe you like to say, Lord, please um, make me someone today who is responsive to others' needs. But you can see it's a today prayer. You know, what to Moses, the, the Hebrew word hayom, it's kind of like having a meditation on the word hayom today, being in, in the day and being in the present and being in the relationships that you, the people you encounter. Um, that's what it's a prayer about. I suggest you, back, you, you put, put it on a piece of paper and shove it on your bathroom mirror with a bit of blue tack and so that as you're brushing your teeth every morning you have this prayer. Um, that's what it is. So make that a project and of course, you know, people keep forgetting. So you have to keep reminding. Keep reminding yourself. Five seconds change the world. Next is life groups. These are accountability groups of two or three people who meet uh, probably over lunch or on a phone call. These days with smartphones and Skype phones, you can actually have two or three people on a, on a single phone call very easily indeed. And it gives you an agenda of questions that you ask each other. Um, and you decide what those questions are, except for the last one. The last one is, have you been completely honest in what you've said today? Okay. And it just it gives, tells you how to do it. It, 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 it. it is ridiculously simple and ridiculously good. And that kind of accountability in love. It's about love. It's not legalism. It's loving each other into life and vitality. It's, it's laughing about the mistakes we make. It's not, not you know, wringing your hands and frowning. Don't, don't get wrinkles on your head like me. You've got to get laughter lines which my beard is covering. The third way to do it is very, very, very powerful and it gets the most space in the pages, prayer triplets. That is three people meet and each of them prays for three people whom they would like to see walk with Jesus as disciples and from a range of parts of their life. Don't make, don't, you know, don't fill up your prayer triplet with everybody in your household. Um, and people, people can come, you know, in three days or 30 years. It's, it's, um, but it's very powerful indeed. Um, 
and I've given you lots of guidelines here on how you do that. It, it seems a little bit artificial, prayer triplets, um, but it is organised. You see how it requires resolution and intention, and that living strong, that living resolutely, that living intentionally in, in, the, in the mission of God is what it takes to change. So you may not go on doing prayer triplets forever, although I do know some a prayer triplet that still meets 17 years later. Uh, and but one of the women said, but we, we've forgotten how to count. We're now four. <laughs> four people praying to three people each, and uh, on they go. I once went to a church in a rural area of New South Wales. I was on holiday, went to the combined evening service that was being held. I think it, was, it might have been the Presbyterian Church. Everybody was there. It was a great group, and uh, they didn't know who I was, and I just quit and sat in the back because I was late as usual. And, uh, and when it came to sharing time in that service, one of the chaps, uh, two seats in front of me, got up and said, just want you to know I've decided to be a Christian. And I prayed a prayer this week, and now I'm a Christian. I just want to thank you for your support and all my answering all my questions. And everybody rejoiced greatly, as you might imagine. And, and uh, so did I. It's one of the best things I ever hear. I'm nearly in tears as I recall it. But one of the things that moved me the most was that after everyone had hooted and hollered, honestly, a little old praying lady got up from across the room and said, we've been praying for you ever since we formed prayer triplets and, uh, and, and we've been praying for you. So she says, so thanks be to God but, and, um, for, for what he's done in your life and in mine, actually, she said. And then, um, and then I think she said... Um, I'll we'll cross you off the list now. <laughs> I'll put somebody else on my triplet. That, that might or might be the most diplomatic thing to do in public, but you get the idea. Okay, so three of you are praying for nine and how you can give them, be hospitable, get to know them, serve them, and share the faith with them. It means as well that if it comes time to have a dinner, um, you can, you, the three of you can uh, you'll invite your nine along. That could be really good. And don't be surprised if all nine become Christians quickly. Don't, don't, don't think this is hard. Okay. So why is it so effective? Well, we've already talked about that. Three times three equals 20. And it gives you some things. After that, on the, on the page, um, oops, page 21, there's a little article for further thinking. Dynamics that enhance and empower evangelism. This, this list is kind of my summary of a list that was generated by a wide, wide range of Christian people with all kinds of different ministries in every state of Australia. And they used to get together regularly to talk about mission and evangelism. And after a while, they started to distill what is it that helps um, the congregations and people to do, their, to do evangelism? And what is it that hinders it? Um, I've given the reference for it at the bottom. This is my, my list of what helps. It is certainly best to focus on strengths. And uh, not on weaknesses and problems. Anyway, it's for your further thinking. Topic seven on the next page is an exercise in imagination. And there are three short exercises here. Um, the, the one is finding parables. I've already hinted at this, um, that you, you, when, you, when you do an exercise which helps people to think about the, their normal life um, decisions, and then you use that as an analogy for the decision to follow Christ. It's kind of like, approaching the question indirectly. And that's what parables all are. You're using something from normal life that, uh, you know, that people are already interested in, and you use that as a parable for uh, something about the kingdom. Um, Footsteps on the Beach is, is world famous um, as a great little parable about discipleship, and almost everybody knows it. Um, these days it's so well known. It is so powerful that people start making jokes about it. When people start making jokes about your parables, you know, you've, you've You've got them. You know they've heard it. The beautiful thing about this is that people are already motivated. They're already, already interested in that subject. So you're not trying to warm them up to get interested. All you've got to do is point out in what way things that they love thinking about or doing, how that is a parable of the kingdom. And this exercise tells you how to do it. You rule out the board in two sides. One is tell us something you really love doing, not a religious thing, just a leisure activity or a craft activity. You know, it'll be reading a book or it'll be kayaking or, you know, uh, playing bridge. And then you ask them, tell me why you like that in particular. And, uh, you know, people, they always say, you know, to start with, oh, it's relaxing or, you know, it gives me something to do. But that's, that's a very superficial answer. They say, well, 
well, if it's bridge playing you like, why don't you, you know, why don't you like poker? I mean, it's something to do. No, no, no. I said, no, I like the way we can calculate or, you know, and you can work in a team. You can calculate the outcome and, you know, out with your opponent. And, and so everybody describes more specifically why it is that specific thing that they really like. Now, when you rub out the left-hand side of the board, the thing they like doing, when you leave up on the right-hand side of the board all their reasons for liking it, what you then find is that you have many parables of the kingdom of God, what it's like to serve Jesus. You know, serving Jesus, to use my bridge playing example, is it's like working out things and working with other people to outwit the opposition. It's quite an amusing little parable of the kingdom of God. You'll see it all through New Testament. It's not kayaking. And my, I just love the energy, of using my energy to go with the flow. Well, that's a nice analogy for or parable for the, the kingdom of God or the reign of God or the community of God or following Jesus. Um, you've just created parables. So that's the exercise. If you listen to people long enough and you know what motivates them, you can use that as a parable for the kingdom of God. They're already motivated and interested in it. Okay? So you're already connecting with people. Finding pauses. Well, this is because most of us mess this up. You know, you realise when your head hits the pillow that night that what that person was talking about was actually that you could have responded with something that was you know, gospel-oriented and you... You missed it, or you knew you you knew there was something here, but you couldn't think of it at the time. Well, this helps you to actually say, "Hang on a sec, there's something important here." And just a fun exercise about uh, helping a, a conversation to pause so that you can respond, or if you need to go back the next day, for instance, and um, it gives you ways to go back and say, "Remember what you were talking about?" Um, okay, it's just normal stuff, but just helping people to do it, and letting them know that they can. And finding pictures. This time it's not so much a storied thing like a walk on the beach, but it's just a picture, an image, a classic. The wind blows where it wills and you hear the sound of it. Thus it is with the Spirit from John chapter 3. It's a beautiful image. It's very powerful. It's a good picture. Um, what I find is there is always something within sight that's a good picture for the kingdom. Um, sitting in front of me at the moment is a ball a ball, and it's a squeezy ball. Right? It's one of these. And um, I got it at a multicultural festival the other day, and they were giving them out. I would think, well, trying to squeeze my around through the crowds, I needed it straight away. Um, but there's always something on your desk or on the table or in the lounge room or in the street that is um, that is a reminder or of, of, of God. This one you can say, you know, God loves the world. He holds it in his hand. That's, that's using this as a picture. Or you can use it as a different kind of picture. And if you want to talk about it as a stress ball, um, um, you know, praying is like this, only better, or, and so on. I've given you some samples of parables and pictures um, uh, at, the, at the end of the exercise. But really, it's most important to find your own. Oh, wow, look, I've even put footsteps on the beach in there. Now we go to page 26. Topic 8, we're nearly there. This is, a, this is a very good introductory article. And there's various ways to do this. What I've often done is I've actually preached this topic as a sermon. And that may, you may not have that opportunity, but you could have this as a conversation. Um, and and there, are, there are sort of sub-exercises in it that you can explore each of these things. But... Because it's taking the assumption that most people have a cringe factor around evangelism, and if and if they're at least not nervous, then they might be aggressive. So they actually need to know the gifts we bring when we share faith in a biblical way. We don't have to be afraid the witness is poisonous or or that we're Bible bashing people. We're hitting them over the head with our beliefs. That's that's not it at all. When Jesus shared the faith, people loved him. They loved him for it, and. I find that too. People love the conversation. And they say, I wish I'd known you years ago. Because when I'm sharing my faith, I'm offering seven beautiful gifts in the way I conduct myself that um, quite apart from the blessings that come from connecting up with the Spirit of God, quite apart from the outcomes, quite
quite apart from the outcome. This is all in the process. All in the process. Okay. The first gift. Well, we're not being like the old evangelist image. Okay. The seven great gifts start with the gift of time, the gift of listening, the gift of blessing. Okay. There's an exercise on that. The gift of authenticity, being authentic instead of role bound. Um, this, you know, if I could pause here, um, the fact is, and the research has shown for many years, that most people who come to follow Jesus do so on the basis of a friend or a family member who is not paid to talk about religion. So it can't be done by, a, you know, media outlet or a big, um, you know, newspaper advertisement, or it can't be done by a full-time Christian worker as much as it can be done by a family or friend who's not paid to talk about it. And if, you, if we don't know how to equip lay people in the church, then 80 to 90% of the future of the church has just been cut off. Simple as that. So the gift of authenticity, instead of being role-bound, just saying how it really is for you, is incredibly powerful. And all the exercises of my story gather around that simple truth. The fifth gift is the gift of community. As we said, belonging and believing go together. Um, and the way in which we connect with uh, people helps them see how they might actually connect with God. And there's a Bible study on biblical community and all its diversity. Then the sixth, the gift of respect. Do you respect yourself and others? A very important question. Um, if all you have to help you think about evangelism is the Great Commission, going to all the world to preach the gospel, you'll become a bit of an aggressive dominator, probably. Maybe not. But 1 Peter 3 talks about having all gentleness and respect and being single of heart and, and ready to speak. It's a beautiful, simple, clear picture. And, but, but notice, with all gentleness and respect for the people you're, you're talking to. Gentleness and respect. Gentleness is a quiet assertiveness and respect. Well, everybody knows what respect is, but quite often, as we said at the beginning, people don't respect themselves as Christians. So you can't really respect another person unless you respect yourself. And what that does is it says, you, know, you, you, you can keep on saying, look, this is just me. This is how I see it. You don't have to take it on board. And you just keep saying things. This is your decision. You don't have to take it on board. I wish you would because I think this is the best thing since toothpaste was invented. But, or whatever you want to say, but, um, but continue to give the, um, the respectful power of the choice and the decision to the other person. But that means you are then free to show respect for your own beliefs. And when you do that, people then respect you more. If you respect yourself, people respect you more. So the gift of respect given is also something received. And the seventh is the gift of hospitality which is giving generously of yourself, not being protective, not being superior, but being equal, living in solidarity, keeping integrity, which is not the same as being perfect. It's just never giving up. And having this question, here's the, here's the question about hospitality. You ready? This is one of the most powerful questions you could ever have in your repertoire. Are you sure you want it? Here it is. How are you really? Not how are you? Nobody ever wants an answer to that question. And if you ask people, how are you? They, well, they won't give you an answer because they know you don't want the answer. But if you said, well, how are you really? They'll probably say something like, oh, you don't want to know. How much time have you got? In which case you say, no, tell me. And they'll give you a short answer. And you, then your quality of your response, whether you have love, joy and peace and patience and kindness, and goodness and patience and self-control, whether you're kind, whether you're fair, all that will can then be expressed. It does sound like it's the work of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? How are you really? Powerful question. If all you knew out of the, this, exercise, this whole series of 10 exercises was those two things, why are you still a Christian? And how are you really? You'll probably find most of the work is done. Put that together with a five-second prayer, and I reckon by the time you finish my story, you will be rocket powered. So topics 9 and 10 have a number of subsections which are about the vitality of faith. 
keeping your faith alive, authentic, liberating, infectious, vital and enthusiastic. There's a number of questions there that help people to know that it's all right to keep on growing, keep on changing, keep on being refreshed in the journey. How to, how to keep vital, how to cross a barrier, how to communicate, how to communicate um, on page 38. The four I's, imagination, information, inspiration and invitation. Keep all four I's in there. It gives you an exercise to how to come up with a sentence like that. Talking people's language. Okay. I want to finish by dedicating my story to the memory of Don Robertson. Don was a volunteer of mine for at least a decade. He's passed away now. Thank God to his reward. But it wasn't. Don was in his 60s before he became a Christian. And as a Christian, he, he was very zealous for God. And he, he volunteered um, in, his, in his retirement to go and become um, a YWAM, you know, youth with a mission. I think he was the oldest youth they'd ever seen at the, at the base camp. And he became a, you know, a great volunteer for lots of causes and a very generous man. He gave me um, days every week to, uh, to, to help do things. Um, uh, well, he's a fantastic man, a mentor and a friend and somebody of a father figure for me since I lost my own dad. Um, and he's, he's a great man. So I, I thank God for Don Robertson and uh, pray that uh, you will too. Well, there's my story. Um, I'm uh, on the bottom of the thing. It says I'm a Uniting Chapel at the University of Western Australia. I've now left there and I'm now um, the Alan Walker Lecturer in Evangelism and Mission at the United Theological College in North Parramatta. And uh, I tell you, it's going fantastic. It is just very exciting. So that's my story. Next time, uh, if you want, we'll, we'll go through your story and you'll get the idea of what's in it. Thanks for being with me.